the actual lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Muhammad Ibn Abdullah Ibn Abdul Muttalib Ibn Hashim Ibn Abdul Manaf Ibn Qusay Ibn Kilab Ibn Murra Ibn Ilyas Ibn Mudar Ibn Ghalib Ibn Fihr Ibn Malik Ibn al nadr Ibn Kinana Ibn Khuzayma Ibn Mudrika Ibn Ilyas Ibn Mudar Ibn Nizar Ibn Ma'ad Ibn Adnan. This is the exact 20. That is his lineage as has been agreed upon. That our Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah astafa kinanata min waladi Ismail. Allah chose kinana from all of the descendants of Ismail. Wastafa Qurayshan min kinana. And he chose Quraysh from kinana. Wastafa min Qurayshin bani Hashim. And he chose the Banu Hashim from the Quraysh. Wastafani min bani Hashim. And he chose me from the Banu Hashim. So we believe that the lineage of our Prophet ﷺ is the best and the most noble lineage ever. That nobody had a more noble lineage. And this was very important, especially for the Arabs of his time. Because for them, everything depended upon lineage. Everything, uh, his status, his nobility, the, any cause he was fighting for, everything depended upon his lineage. So our Prophet ﷺ was chosen to be of the best lineage. We now get to the Prophet's mm -hmm. direct and immediate parents, and these are of course Abdullah and Amina. And so the Amina. daughter of Wahab Amina and the daughter of Abdul Muttalib Abdullah, they agreed to get married. So Abdullah got married to Amina just a few days before the caravan departed. And it is said that he barely spent three or five days with her before he had to go with the caravan. He spent barely a week with this new bride of his and he then departed on the caravan as you know never to be seen again. So they had an extremely short marriage because as soon as they got married he had to leave for the caravan. Catch the caravan go all the way to Syria. On the way back from Syria he fell severely ill with the caravan and he was slowing the caravan down. And by the time they got to Yathrib which was later to become Medina he said to the caravan, I'm slowing you down. I have relatives in Yathrib. I will stay with them until I recover. You go back to Mecca. By the time the caravan got back to Mecca, Amin is all excited. My husband's coming back. I want to tell him that I'm pregnant. And lo and behold, he's not with the caravan. So most likely Abdullah did not even know that Amin was pregnant. In fact, if we believe wow. this version of the event, which is Ibn Sa'ad, he could not have known because he was only with her for four days. So by the time the caravan comes back, she is told that he is sick and he should be coming in a few weeks after he recovers. And then the next news comes that he has in fact passed away in Yathrib. So Amina becomes a widow at the age of 18, 19, young age, maybe even younger than this, carrying the offspring of Abdullah. And the Prophet Wasallam is born in the famous year of the elephant, in the famous hadith of Sahih Muslim, that a man asked the Prophet why do you fast on Mondays? He said, this was the day I was born on. And this was the day that revelation began to me. I Iqra came down on Monday. So we know for a fact he was born on a Monday. There's only one hadith that mentions the birth of the Prophet. He mentions his own birth. And it is a hadith narrated in Muslim Imam Ahmad, Imam Ahmad's book of hadith, and it is an authentic hadith. That when my mother was carrying me, this is the first thing, that when my mother was carrying me, and in one version, wada'atni, gave birth to me. So there are both versions are mentioned, but the point is when he was either in the room or when he came out, my mother saw a light emanate from her that cast its light or it reached all the way to the city of Busra in the land of Syria. So the Prophet is saying that my mother saw a light either in a dream or a physical light, she doesn't mention what, coming from her that came all the way and illuminated the, the palaces or the city of Busra, the palaces of the cities of Busra in Sham, in Syria. Now, what is the significance of this? Scholars have tried to understand why Syria and why you know, this light coming from Amin. Of course, the light is him, the light is the Prophet that she's carrying something that will bring light to Busra of Sham. Allah knows best, but there's some things that have been derived here that Sham or Syria is mentioned because Syria is a blessed land according to our religion. You'll realize that the Islamic Syria is not modern Syria. Sham is broader than modern day Syria. So it is true that our religion considers Sham to be a holy land overall. And of course, the children of Ishaq, Bani Israel, the Jews, they always considered that region to be holy and in particular, Palestine region to be holy. To this day, they do that, right? So we also believe that there is a type of 
holiness in these lands. And that, and that is why Allah says in the Quran, Subhanallah, Asra bi Abdihi Layla min al Masjid al Harami ila al Masjid al Aqsa al Barakna Hawlahu. There is Barakah around Masjid al Aqsa. This is Sham. Sham, there is Barakah over there. And the Prophet predicted that Sham will remain a fortress of Islam. There's always going to be people of Islam in uh, Sham. And amazingly, Sham was the first major province that was conquered after the Arabian Peninsula. Right after the death of the Prophet in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Sham was conquered. And one of the first cities, maybe even the first city that was outside the Arabian Peninsula is Busra. So there is an indication that the Prophet is going to challenge status quo. Sham was the right arm of the Byzantine Empire. I mean, Damascus, do you understand? We think of Damascus as an Arab land or an Arab civilization. Before the coming of Islam, Damascus was the right hand of the Byzantine Empire. It was the jewel of, of the Romans. It was where everything happened, commerce and trade and culture and civilization, everything was there. It was impossible for the Arabs to think that one day Damascus would be the core of Arab civilizations, the Umayyad's capital was Damascus. So by showing the light going to the borders of Syria, there is an indication that Islam is going to conquer this land. It will take over. And that's exactly what happened. That the very first land that was conquered was the land of uh, Syria. And so his grandfather circumcised him on the seventh day. And his grandfather Abdul Muttalib held a feast for him. And his grandfather chose the name Muhammad, which was a unique and unusual name. Some scholars say that this was an unknown name to the Arabs. And one group of scholars says, well, it was known, but it was not common. And this seems to be the stronger opinion. Because right. there are people whose references we have, whose name was Muhammad. But it was a very uncommon name. And there was nobody in Mecca by that name. Nobody in Mecca. So when people asked Abdul Muttalib, why are you calling him by a name that nobody knows? Nobody's heard of. Why don't you call him one of your standard names of your fathers and, and forefathers? He said, I want him to be praised by the people of the earth as I want him to be praised by the people of the heavens. Muhammad means the one who is praised. I want him to be praised by the people of the earth as I want him to be praised by the people in the heavens. The first thing that we know of his life after his birth is the fact that his mother gave him to be raised in the desert. In fact, this was a custom of the elite of the Quraysh. Now you all know the story of Halima. We're just going to summarize it briefly. Halima bint the Sa'diya, the story. famous foster mother know. of the Prophet <laughs> She narrates the story in the first person. And it is recorded in a number of books of hadith and of seerah. And so inshallah, it is an authentic hadith, no doubt about that, that she said that she and her husband were suffering greatly from poverty. So she's explaining why would she want to take another baby? Because that baby gets money. The, the parents give money. And so I convinced my husband to go with the yearly, there was a yearly time that the women of Banu Sa'id ibn Bakr would go to Mecca and would obtain any newly born child who would be willing to be adopted, or not adopted, but foster fed for two, three years. And so she goes with a group, probably five, ten women from her clan, and they enter into Mecca and they find out who has given birth. And they hear of the newest batch that has come forth in the last five or six or seven months. One of them, of course, is the child that was called the orphan child. They were told immediately there's an orphan child. His father's already dead. Some of the women didn't even go visit the house of Amina because the only reason you'd adopt the child is because you want money. And when the child is an orphan, then it's known that you're not going to get that much money. After all, I mean, where is he going to get money from? So some women didn't even go to the house of Amina. Others went and when they saw how poor in the poverty, they didn't like the taking child who was an orphan. Halima as well visited and she tried to move on to find another child because she wanted the money. When the week finished, every one of her friends had acquired one of these newborn children except for Halima. And the only child remaining was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So she told her husband that I feel embarrassed. It's like a bit shameful that all of my friends are going back now to the desert and they have a child and I don't have any. It seems like it's, I'm lost. I mean, it's not fair, meaning I want to be like them. So her husband said, why don't you take the orphan child? Perhaps Allah will bless us through him. And so they agreed to take care of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All the narrations say that as soon as they 
took the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the miracles began right then and there, that she only had one old goat that had stopped giving milk for a long time. As soon as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered into the tent, the goat's udders became full. She had an old mount that they were riding the both of them. And when they put the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam along with the family on this ride on this animal, it became the fastest animal. Generally speaking, this foster care usually lasted two years. During these two years, the blessings that Halima witnessed in her household were so many that she was scared of losing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so she invented a million and one excuses in front of Amina. And she kept on persisting, persisting, persisting until Amina felt that there was so much care and love that the Prophet is in good hands. And so she agreed to extend this contract for a longer period. Of course, it was during the second phase of this foster care that the famous incident of Shaq al-Sadr, of opening up of the heart occurred. When the Prophet was four years old, Anas ibn Malik narrates the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, so there's an authentic hadith, no question about it, that Jibreel came to the Prophet when he was playing with the other children. When Jibreel came, the other children ran away, they're scared. The Prophet stood his ground. As a four-year-old kid, he's displaying bravery. He stood his ground. What do you want from me? And Jibreel came and overpowered him. Sara'ahu. This means that he was struggling. Four-year-old kid is fighting an angel, the strongest angel Allah has created, but he's not going to go without a fight. Again, this shows the determination of the Prophet Muhammad So Jibreel forced him on the ground. You can't fight Jibreel. He forced him on the ground and he opened up his chest. Shaqqa sadrahu. It's just two words. And he took his heart out. And he oh. took out a black slither, a black portion from the heart. And he threw it away. And he said, minka. This is shaitan's portion that he had in you. He took it out. And then he washed the heart in a golden cup of zamzam. And then he put it back. So he washed the heart and he put it back and he sealed it up. So when the children, the foster brother and Shayma, who he was playing with, when the children ran away, they ran back and they said, and they're looking in the distance that there's a man throwing him on the floor, putting blood in and this and that. So they come screaming and running that our brother has died, our brother has been killed, a man has abducted him, a man has killed him. And of course, Halima and others, they became so worried. They come running outside and they found the Prophet ﷺ sitting, his face is pale. SubhanAllah, not wailing, not screaming, not crying. He's the brave for you. He's the bravest for you all the world has ever seen. And when they saw him, they saw those lines on his chest. And Anas ibn Malik says, I could see the traces of that line on his chest. Anas is narrating this hadith when the Prophet is around 60 years old. This incident was what concerned Halima. And she decided before anything else happens, let me quietly return the Prophet to <laughs> Just Amina. in case anything so else crazy happens. The Prophet was returned mm. to Amina. We only have one incident that is recorded during this time. Amina decided to take her son to Yathrib. And she had with her the one servant that it is said that Abdul Muttalib gifted them when they got married. And this is Ummi Ayman. Abdul Muttalib gifted his son when they got married, Ummi Ayman. So Amina traveled to uh, Yathrib, which is now called Medina, along with Ummi Ayman. And the little boy, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Prophet Sallallahu stayed there for a few months on the way back in a small little settlement, which is still present to this day, and it is called al Abwa. Amina herself fell ill, and she passed away right then and there, and Umm Ayman had her buried by the people of the village, Abwa, and so to this day her grave is at a place called Abwa. And then when the Prophet is barely six years old, he loses his mother and his father, so he is then entrusted to Abdul Muttalib, the chieftain of the Quraysh. In one occasion, the uncles of the Prophet ﷺ sent the Prophet ﷺ to find some lost camels. Ibn Sa'id mentions the reason why his uncles chose a little kid, who was probably seven, eight years old, to go find the camels was because, listen to this, he never did anything except that it was successful. So now the uncles are getting desperate. Camels are expensive creatures. The uncles are getting desperate and they can't find the camels. So they decide, well, this boy, whatever he does, it works. Let's go send him out alone in the desert to find the camels. And when they sent the Prophet ﷺ, he was delayed in coming back. And Abdul Muttalib, when he found out, he was furious at them. How could you have done this? Why did you send the boy? 
But of course, they sent him because they want the camels back, right? Abdul Muttalib was furious and he was pacing and walking around waiting for the Prophet to come. And as soon as he came, he hugged him and he said, from now on, I will never let you out of my sight. As we all know, at the age of eight, once again, for the third time, our Prophet became an orphan. First his father, then his mother, and now his grandfather. And one of the things that Abdul Muttalib did on his deathbed is that he entrusted the Prophet ﷺ to his son Abu Talib. And so Abu Talib takes charge of the Prophet ﷺ, and Abu Talib lives a long life, and Abu Talib passes away when the Prophet ﷺ is over 50 years old. So he remains wow. with the Prophet ﷺ. Okay. So the next bit of information we have was the first job of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, hadith is in Bukhari, so it is completely authentic. Allah never sent a Prophet except that he was a shepherd. So they said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah. So he said, yes, I was. I was a shepherd. And I used to tend to the flock of the people of Mecca in return for some qararid, some pennies. What are some of the wisdoms? Why would Allah Azza wa Jal do this? If Allah had willed, our Prophet ﷺ would have been born in the lap of luxury. Sheep are very similar to men in that they need to be taken care of or else they're gonna go astray. And every single animal has a personality and the shepherd understands this personality that you need to treat every animal according to that animal's personality. Some sheep are stubborn, some are soft and gentle, right? Some, they know where they're going, others they follow the pack. Some are the leaders, some are not. So the shepherd gets to understand each and every sheep in the flock. And he deals with every animal according to its personality. And this is what a leader needs to do. And this is what a Prophet of Allah needs to do. That they need to deal with every person according to their mizaj, according to their personality. In another few years, even a more famous incident occurred. And this is called the Hilf al-Fudul or the Hilf al-Mutayyabin. The treaty or the pact of Fudul, also called the treaty of Mutayyabin. And at this stage, the Prophet ﷺ is probably in his early 20s. What happened was, a person from the tribe of Zubayr, and Zubayr is a tribe in Yemen. And so the Yemenites, when you're in Mecca, the people did not consider this tribe to be as elite. They are a low-class tribe. And they're very far away. So when you're far away, what this means is you don't have people willing to fight for you, right? So what happens? This person from the tribe of Zubayr sold an item before Hajj. He's come as a merchant. He's brought his leather, he's brought his good. That's how you get your money. And he sold a number of items to Al-As ibn Wa'il, the father of Amr ibn Al-As. And Al-As ibn Al-Wa'il, he is a chieftain, he's a politician, he's a career statesman in the Quraysh, and he's a rich businessman. He sold it to him before Hajj. And Al-As said, I'll give you the money after Hajj before you go back to Yemen. Come to me after and I'll give it to you. So he goes, okay, fine. I can wait that long. I don't need it now. I need it back in Yemen. So he performs the Hajj and then he says, I need my money. Al-As says, come back tomorrow. So he comes back tomorrow. Al-As says, come back tomorrow again. Comes back tomorrow. And then he continues doing this until he realizes that he's not going to get his money back. And so this person goes to the other sub-tribes. And everyone makes an excuse. Why? Because Al-As ibn Wa'il is a politician. He is rich. He is a leader. And therefore, feeling completely trapped and not having any other outlet, he decided to make this a public issue. What did they do in those days? They would write poems. And so, one day, when everybody is in front of the Kaaba, which is basically everybody would gather around Asr time, all the people of Mecca would now come and they would say this is a social place as well. He now comes and he says out loud his poem that he has compiled. So he says, Ya ala fihrin, O tribe of Fihr, O Quraysh, limadlumin bita'atahu. I am a one who has been unjustly treated because of my merchandise. Bibatni Makkata. I am in the valley of Makkata. Na iddari wal nafari. Far away from my home and far away from people to protect me. Wa muhrimun. I'm still in my ihram. Ash'ath. My hair has not been combed because he's in ihram. Lam yaqdi umratahu. I haven't even finished my umrah. Ya lil rijali. Where are my men to help me? Wa bain al hijri wal hajari. Between the hijr, the maqam Ibrahim, and the hajr, the stone, you are doing this to me. Inna al haram li man tammat karamatuhu. The true haram belongs to those who are noble. Wa la haram li thawb al ghadir al fajri. There is no sanctity to the one who wears a thobe. Most likely there was a thobe in there involved as well. Who wears a thobe 
while he is a cheat and a steal and a lowly person. So the news spread like wildfire. And Az-Zubayr ibn Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet's elder uncle, Az-Zubayr ibn Abdul Muttalib, heard of this. And he said, we have to do something about this. This is not going to go on anymore. And he convened a gathering of all of the senior members of the Quraysh in the house of somebody whose name you should memorize. He comes up in Sirah over and over again. Abdullah ibn Jud'an. And here is where they agreed to a pact, a treaty. They would side with the oppressed against the oppressor regardless of which tribe the oppressor belonged to. And they said even if the one who is shown injustice is from a faraway tribe and the oppressor is from a Quraysh sub-tribe, we will side with the one who has been oppressed and we will get his full right from the oppressor. And all right. they all went in front of the Kaaba and they publicly announced this now, and they signed their names on a document. Now, there is no document, there is no signature. What do you do in those days? You dip your hands in perfume and you put that perfume on the Kaaba on the same place. Everybody puts it on the same place. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ said, I witnessed in the house of Abdullah ibn Jud'an a treaty that were I asked to uphold it even in Islam, I would do so. If I were to ask to follow the treaty even now, I would do so. And I would not be willing to give up my place for a lot of red camels. Meaning, if you were to tell me, if you were to give me a lot of money and I were not present at that treaty, I would not do so. I would not be willing to do so. In that treaty, he's saying, they all agreed that the rights would be given back to the ones who deserved them and that no oppressor would have the upper hand over the one who was oppressed.